I want to uh, thank everybody uh, for joining us today. We're uh, launching a report of the CSIS Ukraine Economic Reconstruction Commission. I'm Dan Rundy. I'm a senior vice president. I've been directing this, the work of the commission uh, for the last nine months. I want to, I need to thank a couple people. I want to thank Connor Savoy, the primary author of the report, a senior fellow here at CSIS. I want to thank Yanina Stagun for all of her tireless efforts as well. So in particular, there are many other people at CSIS I want to thank, but I want to in particular single out Connor and Yanina. I also want to thank all of our financial supporters. Um, you, we, we, it's a, uh, the work of many. We, what I said to our funders was, these were all, if, if, you, if you entrusted us with money, we'd work really hard with the money. But second, it would all be funders you'd be comfortable and proud of being associated with. And so I, we worked really hard to make sure that this was all, you know, this was all from, you know, funders that um, these are really people we're really proud to stand with. So I really want to thank all of our funders as well. Then I want to thank all of our commissioners, in which we have several here. <clears throat> We've done 20, you know, I, I was pretty good at a cocktail party on Ukraine reconstruction in Ukraine 20, you know, nine months ago. Uh, I've been several times. I'm on the board of the Western Newly Independent States Enterprise Fund. <clears throat> and so I've been there three, you know, and I know the country a bit and I admire it. But what we thought we should do is, we first thought we needed to convene a very high level group. And we've been very fortunate that many people, including three folks on the stage here, um, agreed to be commissioners or co-chairs for this commission. We've got a diverse, high level, global set of commissioners. But we also thought what we needed to do was to call upon experts <clears throat> from Ukraine, from Europe, from the rest of the world, on different topics. So we've done 20 seminars on topics such as agriculture, Ukraine reconstruction discuss, EU accession, Ukraine reconstruction discuss, governance, Ukraine reconstruction discuss. You get the idea. We've done 20 of those. So we now have a network of about 500 people who've stepped forward to help us with this. We've produced 10 papers. <clears throat> we've convened our commission three times. And we've, um, we've re we're releasing this report today. So why would we do all of this work? We did all this work because we think the stakes are really high. The stakes are really high. This isn't about just Ukraine. It is about Ukraine, but it's more than just Ukraine. This is about whether we're going to accept you know, the rule of law or the, the rule of the jungle. Are we going to allow, you know, there's a free people that wants to choose its future destiny, and we should stand with them. But it's a, a lot more than a lot more than just that. We've also focused as part of our work on trying to understand, as we think about the rebuilding and the future of Ukraine, there's a big private sector element to this. There ain't going to be enough foreign aid. There ain't going to be enough MDB money. There ain't going to be enough DFI money to rebuild Ukraine. We're going to need a very active private sector. And I hope a lot of it is American private sector. So let me just say two other things. I'm going to shut up because I want to turn it over to Sir he who's, who's with us to make some opening remarks from Ukraine Invest. My, I've done 100 meetings on this. My deepest thought is that we need to align Ukraine reconstruction with European Union accession. We need a real timeline. It needs to be fast. <clears throat> and that is the carrot. That's the, we need, and so anyone that says 20 years, that's too darn long. And we need, real time, we need a real timeline. So our ask of our European Union partners is give us a real timeline and start it. That would be my ask of our European Union friends. And I'll say one last thing, I'm going to stop. So what does success look like? Because one of the questions as we had all these meetings was, well, what does success look like? Well, success for Ukraine looks like as follows. The GNP per capita of Poland, the agricultural capacity of Canada, the manufacturing capacities of the Czech Republic, the tech sector of Estonia, the quality of governance of, I don't know, of, an, of, a, of a relatively recent, you know, Bulgaria, Romania, the military capacities of Israel, so no one messes with them ever again, fully embedded in the Euro-Atlantic community, a full-on member of the EU, 
and yes, a full-on member of NATO. That's what, in my mind, what success looks like. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to ask um, Sirhi Sivkac. I think I got it. Sivkac. Sirkac. Sirhi Sirkac, who is the head of Ukraine Invest, to make some opening remarks. We've worked really hard to make sure anything we've done on Ukraine has had significant Ukrainian representation, including in the commission. And every seminar we've done had significant Ukrainian voices and presence, because we know it's really important. So, Sirhi, thank you for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Daniel. Can you hear me well? Yep. Yeah. So, thanks to C. SIS for doing this report. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. I think it's an excellent report, and I would probably sign every letter and put my signature under every word that is in this report. It's a very good combination of ideas and a solid call for action. And this is what we need to have now. Ukraine has suffered a lot during the last 11 months. We will be going into our unfortunately, into an anniversary of the, this, the beginning of this war. So we have to fight back. We have to fight back not only in our front lines, but we have to fight back economically. And that is the key. Because Ukraine cannot go back to old-fashioned business after the war will end. We have to transform our economy. And that's why I would like to start with the title of this report. It's called Transformation of Ukraine. So I thank you very much for that word. Many people talk about reconstruction or rebuilding of Ukraine. No, we cannot reconstruct or rebuild Ukraine to the level of raw materials exporting country. We have to transform our economy. We have to transform our economy into modern economy that will be equivalent to those countries that Daniel has mentioned or to any other developed countries throughout the world. That is important. Topics that were raised in the report are very important. Coordination of activities, process of reforms in Ukraine, tackling corruption, effective rule of law in the country, privatization, digitalization, you name it. You have it all in your presentation. But what is more important, and I began with that, it's call for action. We need to start acting now. We cannot wait till the end of the war. We need to create programs right now. We need to think about programs. That's why your proposal to create a special envoy in EU is very important. I think these special envoys have to be created in every G7 country and Ukraine specifically. That's why Ukraine initiated the process to create a fund for reconstruction or development of Ukraine, or transformation of Ukraine, because we have to sit down around the table and think, how are we going to transform Ukraine? We also need to think whether this is about Ukraine or European order and global order. Because I don't think that this is a local war that affects Ukraine only. We have to reconsider how European countries and other countries from throughout the world are paying for energy supplies. Why aggressor was able to receive $1 billion a day for their energy supplies. How they use this money? They've used this money to build weapons and to attack democracy. Why Ukraine was attacked? Not because of some false, false, states, false statements about lack of democracy or abuse of Russians in Ukraine. No, Ukraine was only attacked because we have made our choice, European choice. And Russia was afraid that we will go away from them, that we will not be any more ex-Soviet Union country, that we will become a country in Europe, a developed country, a member of OECD club, a member of the global yes. democratic community. That is important. So attack was made on Ukraine, but the real attack was on democratic world. So that's why we are thankful for all uh, developed countries throughout the world that support Ukraine. We are thankful to military support, social support, economic support. But this is not the end of our cooperation. It's just the beginning. We have to become members of European Union. And all businesses that will participate in reconstruction of Ukraine will have to 
get benefits, will have to get profits, they will have to operate in an effective modern European country. Today I'm in Vienna. I am attending a conference where, I, where, where about 1,500 1, people from financial world are coming to Vienna you know, to talk about latest economic developments. And I have met today, I don't know, 10, 15 investment bankers. And they all tell me that every meeting with private investors <coughs> they have ends or starts with Ukrainian topic. Even if the meeting was devoted to another uh, topic, everyone is interested. That is a signal of a strong attention to Ukraine. That is a signal that private investors, investors they feel interest, they see potential in cooperation with, with Ukraine. So now we have to think how to facilitate that. And uh, ideas that are embedded in reports are very sound. And I like that these ideas suggested to begin implementation at the beginning of 2023. This is when we have to start doing so. I would like to tell you about one of my experience, recent experience in December 2023. I visited a conference in France on rebuilding Ukraine. President Macron made his opening speech, and then he passed the floor to President Zelensky, who was participating online. President Zelensky, he couldn't start his speech. More than 700 businesses, business leaders, CEOs, owners, they stood up, and there was a standing ovation to President Zelensky for five or seven minutes. Wow. And they stopped only because President Zelensky just, he couldn't wait, so he started to talk. That is a signal of strong support and admiration of President Zelensky actions and actions of people of Ukraine, because we fight for our democracy as one Ukrainian family. And the idea that comes to my mind, and this is maybe something that may be missing in report. The role of private business right now. There are private companies that already can start thinking about doing business in Ukraine. They can start planning investment projects. They can evaluate opportunities in Ukraine right now. And that would be a very strong signal for Ukraine. I can salute Irish global company Kingspan, they already announced big investment project of Ukraine. They will invest more than 200 million euros and they will build the biggest technological campus in Ukraine. We support them as Ukrainian West and they also called their project in Ukraine Sirsha. Sirsha, translated from Irish, means freedom. So they are really keen to support Ukraine, but they also understand that the profits in Ukraine will be good and their business will be profitable. So for me, for people of Ukraine, for President Zelensky, for all governments of Ukraine team, the best and strong and strongest ovation right now will be interest of biggest American companies, international companies in Ukraine. You can start planning your investment today. It doesn't take a lot of money, it takes time but it will take only one or two percent of the overall cost of the investment project to go through your investment planning stage. So we encourage you to do that. We are always open to cooperation. We're always open to cooperation with CSIS and other partners through, throughout the world. Trust me, any company that will start planning business in Ukraine will not only do a good, admirable thing, the company will also never regret its business decision. So I will stop here now. We'll be happy to answer any questions or just I will pass on my contact details to organizers. If anyone wants to inquire about opportunities in Ukraine, please do so. So, Sergey, thanks a lot. That was fantastic. Um, so a couple of things. One is we I've got I've gotten the agreement of all the commissioners to re up for much of 2023. So this is a, a, a report of the commission. So we're gonna be continuing to work. So one of the asks I'd have you is, Sergey, is give CSIS some homework assignments and we're available to help you on an ongoing basis. And I, I wanna speak on behalf of the commission that there is 
an eagerness to be helpful to the Ukrainian cause. And so we continue to, we're going to be looking for opportunities to be helpful to you and to the Ukrainian government. One of the things we're thinking about is, is hosting a conference later in the spring of American businesses uh, focused on reconstruction and investment. And so I hope you'll come to that and I'll come back to you about that, but I hope you'll, you'll, you'll pencil in the first half of May potentially in the US if we can get you to come and, and help us bring some Ukrainian businesses and some decision makers to, because we want American businesses to be a big part of the reconstruction. Absolutely, you can count on us and we will do whatever possible to present you a new Ukraine because trust me, Ukraine already went through a very serious transformation during the last 11 months. So, so and things like yeah. corruption, and uh, you know, ineffective state administration, uh, rule of law, they will be under very serious scrutiny, not only by government, not only by president, but also by people of Ukraine, by all those, those, by all those defenders that are defending our country right now. They will come back to their homes and they will have zero tolerance to all practices. So, so, so Sergey, could we, you talk a little bit more about the governance and rule of law issues? I think that I think there's been significant progress. One of the things we talk about in the report is there's been significant progress around issues of governance and rule of law since 2014. I think one of the reasons is that, that Ukraine has a, a very active civil society and that they're an important watchdog, as you were saying. What message do you want to give to folks? And you've mentioned this now, but how should investors think about rule of law and governance issues in Ukraine? And how, how does that fit into things like EU accession or OECD accession? Because it seems to me that those are going to be vectors or ways in which major improvements or you know, further progress will be made in the areas of governance and rule of law as part of EU accession. Do you, do you agree with that? Absolutely, and we will have to, we'll still have to do a lot, but uh, Ukraine has improved a lot, as I said. You know, we can see on daily basis cases, uh, you know, being conducted by National Anti-Corruption Bureau. And I, I can see some high-level people that being investigated, you know, like members of parliament, uh, high-level officials, um, you know, people that have to be transparent. And if they are accused, and if there will be prosecution, they have to be sentenced. We have to be clear here. So people of Ukraine, in first instance, people of Ukraine, not even investors, people of Ukraine, they want to see justice. And I'm sure that government of Ukraine, our top political management, understands that, and they will be able to deliver on that. Good. My other question for you is about <clears throat> the size of state-owned enterprises in the economy. Could you talk about, Sergey? how is, it's easy for, for us to sit and for me to sit in, a, in an ivory tower in Washington thinking deep thoughts about <clears throat> reforms. It's another thing given all that's going on right now in Ukraine, but it seems to me that one of the challenges over, you know, when, when the opportunity comes is gonna be how you take on the fact that there's a very large state-owned enterprise sector in the economy. How are you all thinking about this issue? Well, the answer is clear, and Ukraine was always active in privatization process. We have a new head of state property fund of Ukraine. He said that, it's, it's a very uh, good message that he said. He said that in Ukraine, we will privatize everything except for dignity. <laughs> and it, this is a good message, you know, so we are happy to do that. There will be, of course, a couple of national champions left as a state-owned enterprises, strategic companies, strategic for uh, economy of Ukraine. But the rest of the companies, they will be privatized. We already have about seven uh, big SOEs, uh, uh, you know, they will be, uh, they're waiting for privatization at the beginning of the year or second half of the year. And there will be hundreds of smaller size uh, SOEs that will be privatized. In Ukraine, we have more than 3,000 SOEs, but more than 1,000 are already insolvent. So we are being left with about 2,000 SOEs that have to be privatized. They have to be privatized 
or we can go through a concession, for example. So we can have investor who will invest in Ukraine. He will have investment obligation, but also state of Ukraine will understand that this company have been, has been given to a private investor, not just for him to keep it to some point, but to invest right now. And uh, we already seen that beginning of the year, several auctions uh, were conducted. Um, second half of the 2022, also hundreds of auctions were conducted. I have read your comments, well, your team's comments about banks. I agree with that. Banks, banking system in Ukraine has to be private. And we need to see competition between them because competition Economic competition brings prosperity, brings strategy, and brings innovations and good services. Good. Well, look, Sergey, we really appreciate your time. We know you only had a little bit of time. It's, we'd obviously, if you could stay for the rest of the panel, you're welcome to, but I know you have some other things you may have to attend to. We really appreciate it. Can I ask everybody in giving Sergey a, a round of applause? Thanks, Sergey. I hope to see much of you in 2023. Thanks for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your cooperation and support. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm really grateful to the panelists that are here. I want to thank my good friend, Ambassador Paul Dobryansky, who is one of our co-chairs for the, for the commission. I want to thank Michael Polsky, who is also another one of our co-chairs. I really appreciate you, Michael, being here. And I want to thank Ambassador Bill Taylor, one of our commissioners. It was, it, we had a real, we've had a really great set of commissioners, um, really proud of the work that we've done. They've all contributed in unique ways and it's been very, very helpful. And they've all brought interesting and important perspectives to this important work. So I think maybe what I'd do is I'd ask each of my friends and panelists to just make some initial provide some initial thoughts about Ukraine, its recovery and reconstruction, either the work or the report or just some broader thoughts about about Ukraine itself. And so, so Ambassador Bryansky, let me start with you, please. All right. Well, thank, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dan, Connor, and Yanina, uh, you did a fantastic job. Uh, really, congratulations to you and to CSIS. I think uh, bringing us together in this commission has been extremely timely. It's very relevant. And also, even to use the term of the report, it's transformative. And the intent was and is to be transformative in terms of Ukraine's future direction. So I'm very proud to be part of that process and part of this, this very dynamic uh, team here. Um, Secondly, let me put it in a context. When we went through the various recommendations and you counted, I think you said some hundred meetings, not all of us attended, no. every, all of you did, <laughs> CSIS did, but I, I know I attended a good number of meetings separate from our commission meetings. You can't divorce this issue and this topic obviously from what's playing out on the ground in Ukraine today. So I first, I wanted to inject that because we've witnessed a unprovoked, brutal invasion of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, which Ukraine is doing its utmost to regain all of its uh, independence and its uh, territory uh, uh, going uh, back to 2014 and including Crimea, as has been stated by Zelensky and others. I feel it is important to give that backdrop because that military battle that is taking place is so crucial. And those of us on this commission have also been very forthright in stating our very strong and fervent view that it's not only about getting the military equipment rapidly and specifically to match Ukraine's needs on the ground, but to work with them to ensure a victory here for Ukraine. That has to be the backdrop here. And I wanted to state that upfront because I know that all of us share that uh, and feel that that's crucial and a crucial foundation here. So 
clearly the military assistance, the economic sanctions that are in place, and also the diplomacy of the administration, I think has been quite significant in terms of uh, our uh, being sewn up uh, with uh, our transatlantic partners, but not just only our transatlantic partners. Let's be reminded that there are those across the globe, many in the Indo-Pacific, in Asia, uh, certainly in this uh, regard, who have also provided very crucial assistance. I have in mind, and this is not excluding others, but certainly in this case, uh, Australia, uh, Japan, among others. In terms of the report, I wanted to cite, because it's in the report, and I have this paper here, I'm glad that it was cited at the beginning, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von, von der Leyen, she said the following, and I think she's exactly right in her words, quote, Ukraine has everything it takes for a successful reconstruction, determination, a vibrant civil society, an impressively resilient economic base, and many friends around the globe. And that sentiment also, I think, undergirds not just only the sentiment of the report, but also, Dan just said, it wasn't just our meeting about the report, but now it's marching forward, and it's the actual implementation, and literally uh, putting action to substance. I'll close on, on this, because just a few opening words, and that is, I'm very taken by the title and what Sir He said. The title of the report, Enabling an Economic Transformation of Ukraine. This is, if one could say, an opportunity albeit with a tragic circumstance, to say the least, tragic and br brutal circumstance, but an opportunity for an economic transformation, an opportunity, as Ukrainians have described themselves, for modernization, digitalization, an eradication of corruption, and a firm rule of law basis. And I wanted to emphasize that component because I also think the fact that CSIS, by focusing on the private sector, highlights that piece where the private sector can actually bring that to bear. So thank you and congratulations on the report. Thanks, Ambassador. Michael Polsky, please. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Polsky. I am, you can hear my accent. I was born in Ukraine, came here about 40 years ago. So I am kind of Ukrainian-American or American-Ukrainian, whatever, which way are you, in, you want to say. So. Obviously, I have a personal connection to all of this, and when CSAS called me and asked me to participate, certainly I agreed even before he finished his first sentence. Um, I'm also running one of the largest in the world energy company, primarily renewable, but we also do other transmission line, gas plants, so on, so I have a first knowledge in energy and uh, a lot of my interest, obviously, in the energy field. But just as a general statement, I don't think anybody disagree that, and then said, we cannot lose this war, neither Ukraine nor West, because if we lose this war, then obviously implications are enormous. So first of all, we have to put whatever resources we have, military and civil and humanitarian resources to help Ukraine to go through this. We, we just don't, in, in my view, there is no choice. It's not like, you know, maybe or whatever. It doesn't matter, no. it it, it Matter. Another thing we all agree, and Ambassador, you said clearly, this is about transformation. Ukraine cannot be the same Ukraine as we saw pre-Russian invasion. Okay, it has to be a complete transformation of this society. <clears throat> Ukraine has to be a much different country in order to reconstruct in the right way, and we all agree with that. So whether it's civil society, whether it's legal system, whether it's economic structures of Ukraine, it all has to be redone and rethought in order for Ukraine to be, to be successful and not to be kind of in the middle, but really firmly assert itself as a, as a country with, with a big future. But I want to make a few comments about the energy. I've been in energy field through the 1970s, come to the United States when in mid-70s we had oil embargo. We talk about energy security for generations not for years, but for generations, but we've never done anything. We've, we always, as a society, feel that energy security is about price of gasoline, whether it's cheaper or more expensive. But clearly what, what we learn now, that 
energy is a weapon, and perhaps more important than nuclear weapons, because with nuclear weapons, you have sort of a lot of consequences. With energy, you can kill people in masses or destroy people's lives. And, uh, and you know, it, it, as what we can see Russia doing. So clearly, the whole meaning of weaponizing of energy now is uh, completely have different meaning to most of us than it used to be before. And I think whatever we do in energy field, by the way, whether here in the United States and the Western world and in Ukraine, we have to take this into account. So energy is the weapon and we have to like, like <clears throat> Ukrainian colleague Sergei said, billion dollars a day going to the enemy where you see that kind of, in the middle of the war, we, we finance an enemy war. I mean, it's only an energy, right? They may not build nuclear weapons that they can sell their energy. But um, I also wanna, I wanna add a couple of other things. It's gonna be very difficult. We, we cannot have a rosy picture as far as rebuilding Ukraine because we, in a way, the entire world now in a different position. I mean, all, most countries in the world, in the West, particularly the United States and other Japan, they're thinking about energy, co energy freedom as well. So there is a lot of resources going and transforming our own society here. Uh, in the United States, Europeans have a very ambitious plan, you know, some Asian countries as well. So Ukraine is a basically in line to compete for rest of the world for the resources. World has changed. In 2023, it's not the same world as we saw in, in 2019, and we have to be realistic with this. So what I what I really advocate in, in here in the report and with CSA is that we have to look in two ways for Ukraine to build energy independence, but also manufacturing base. So Ukraine can no longer depend on the rest of the world supplying the materials, you know, and we can afford for Ukraine become dependent on China, for example. So Ukraine has to build their own economic bases, create jobs, create <clears throat> manufacturing capacity. So if they want to build, you know, power plants, whether it's renewable, wind, solar, they have to manufacture their own equipment. If they, you know, you hear about transformers and all this other equipment, they have to have their own production facilities. So I think there's going to be some thought how it's done, because you cannot be in a position waiting in line for critical equipment coming from elsewhere. But, but I think I want to just conclude my statement saying here that I maybe self kind of selfishly speaking, I always said energy is the key, is a fundamental, is a basis, a foundation for prosperity and security of any society. And now we see that this is the case. So I think rebuilding energy infrastructure in Ukraine is a foundation to rebuilding everything else. Without electricity, you cannot have IT, you cannot have manufacturing, you cannot have heat, you cannot have people comfortable living, you cannot have jobs. So energy is very important and I think we're here all and you know, we would like to help Ukraine as much as we all can to really rebuild the country and transform the country more importantly than even rebuild it. Thank you. Thanks. Ambassador Taylor. Dan, Paula, Michael, uh, thank you. It's great to, great to be here. Um, congratulations again on this report, um, in particular the focus on the private sector's role. Um, let me reinforce what Michael just said, one of the early things, that Ukraine must win this war. Ukraine must win. This is, they have to win, and so we need to support them. And so that will be an important theme. Um, and they need to be secure. They need to be secure, and the private sector, Dan, that you pointed out is going to play such a big role um, in reconstruction, um, is not going to be there if, it's not, if Ukraine's not secure. So the security is going to be a big part of that, and as we know, probably CSIS knows very well in this building, uh, the best security is going to be NATO, which you said at the, at the beginning. In the meantime, because that won't happen quickly, uh, but in the meantime, there needs to be the, the focus of the United States, as well as the rest of NATO, as well as the rest of the world, to make Ukraine very strong, to make Ukraine have the ability to deter another war, another invasion. So giving them, as we've done with Israel, um, the ability to deter and defend itself while they rebuild, and while they apply 
to NATO and hopefully are accepted, that security is going to be a really important piece for all the things that we do, including energy. Now, I take this point, uh, but security is going to be important. The only other main point, Dan, and then um, is where's the money coming from? A lot of it is going to be private sector. Private sector is going to need security. There's going to be a lot of things that have to be done in Ukraine that the private sector are not ready to invest in. You know, rule of law, uh, the governance, um, the reconstruction of basic infrastructure, uh, and our Congress, whichever way our Congress is, that way, that way thank you, uh, our Congress is going to be asking why should they, or indeed, why should American taxpayers have to pay for a lot of that? And they will ask, rightly, why not the Russians? The Russians destroyed this country a, to a large degree. They should repair it. They should reconstruct it. They should pay reparations. And it turns out there's a way to make them do that. $300 billion of Russian money are in G7 banks. Some 40 billion are right here in the United US banks. We need to, to lead that. We need to be able to move that money into a fund, an international fund, that the Ukrainians and overseen by, I don't know, the World Bank or you or somebody, um, to be sure that this money is well spent. But that money is there and it needs to be moved from frozen assets into to this fund. So security and, uh, and the Russian funds. Ambassador, I'm, I've been, it's been really wonderful work with all of you and I've really appreciated um, the investment of time that you've given us, Ambassador Taylor in particular, I want to come back to this issue of governance because I think it's sort of an elephant in the room. <clears throat> and you were served as U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, and we've talked about the issue of governance and rule of law. What's your, there are many people, there are several narratives about governance and corruption in Ukraine. I, I don't subscribe to all the narratives. One of them, could you just talk a little bit about, could you just go double click a little bit further on this issue of governance and corruption? Because I think it's a it's a, it's a it can, you know it's an issue that you know we've talked about in the report. But you, you lived there for a period of time. You've dealt with some of these issues. Could you talk about this? Sure, Dan. Sure. <clears throat> no one wants to clean up, defeat corruption more than Ukrainians. Um, President Zelensky ran on two planks in his in his campaign. Um, in 2019. One was to win the war um, uh, on Ukrainian terms. Uh, he would bring peace, win the war the on Don Ukrainian Bass terms. And the, Don Bass in Crimea. the war that had been going on since 2014. <clears throat> yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, the second thing he wanted to do was defeat corruption. He ran on those two planks. He made, and he came, I was there when, when he was inaugurated and when he was uh, the first uh, six months, nine, seven months. Well, well um, he believed that. He honestly believed that he could defeat corruption, and if he just sat down with President Putin, he could, he could solve this war. Well, that turned out not to be the case. He was over-enthusiastic, but that's better than being under-enthusiastic. He was optimistic, better than being pessimistic. He, he drove hard on this issue, Dan, of governance. And uh, many people said, well, Mr. President, you're going to be you know, working to, uh, to reduce corruption. And he said, no, I'm going to defeat corruption. And he did some things, um, uh, took some actions. My, my main point, first point, Dan, in response to your question is, the Ukrainians know what has to be done. Second, and they're doing it, they've been doing it. And just to give President Poroshenko, Zelensky's predecessor, some credit, there were some things done during the, the Poroshenko administration as well, setting up the national, you know, NABU, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau. Um, and, uh, uh, Melinda back there knows something about all of this corruption work. She's done some great work on this thing uh, back in, in that time as well. So, so um, there, were thing, there were institutions set up. There was a high anti-corruption court. There was a special prosecutor. Um, these things were put in place, and Zelensky then staffed them. Zelensky then actually made them work. Uh, so first point is the Ukrainians will do that. Second point is one of the reasons that we think, uh, that many people think that this is a problem is because there's a very strong, aggressive media 
journalists in Ukraine go after corruption, as they should, and they're given the ability to do that. One of the things that the Poroshenko folks put in place um, uh, is the strongest disclosure, governmental official disclosure requirement of any in the world. It's, 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 it's more restrictive, it's more rigorous, it's more uh, demanding than in, here in the United States. If you're a government official, you have to list every watch, every car, every apartment that you or your spouse or kids have. You have to list all these things and you have to put it online. It's open to the public. So the journalists that are very aggressive, they can go online, they can say, ah, there's this, uh, there's this governor um, and he owns what? He's Flats Rolex, in Dubai. Right. He's got four Rolexes, he's got eight cars. <laughs> Um, and we know how much money he makes. Where does it come from? And so they go after him, as they should. So the perception, Dan, which is what we measure, we measure the perception of corruption, um, is high. A lot of it is because of the, of the focus we put on it. Last thing on the corruption. Um, and you mentioned this at the beginning, Dan. Uh, you know where I'm going on this. Ukrainians really want to be in the European Union. They really want to be a member of the European Union. And in order to get into the European Union, they need to do a lot of things. Um, and the Europeans have laid out a, a series of steps, seven specific steps. Five of those steps are related to, to governance and anti-corruption, anti-oligarch. Um, so if, they, if the Ukrainians meet those standards, which they really want to do because they want to be in the EU, that will address this issue as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, Michael, thank, thank you for your, your opening comments. <clears throat> we, I think some of the most interesting conversations we had at the commission uh, were on energy issues, and I um, really appreciate our energy team uh, for all the work that they did, Ben, in particular. Thanks for being here. Um, we, we, we leveraged all of our experts across CSIS. <clears throat> but I, I would like, and I think some of your opening comments were really interesting about the fact that, you know, when I think about Ukraine's current economy, it's hands, brains, and grains. It's manufacturing, it's tech, and it's agriculture. And I think your suggestion, your idea, which I haven't heard elsewhere, <clears throat> is that Ukraine leverage its manufacturing strength to create new energy industries is particularly interesting. <clears throat> Can I ask you to sort of fast forward five, 10, 15 years into the future. What's the kind of energy mix that Ukraine, what's an ideal energy mix? What kind of energy mix could Ukraine have 15 years from now, given the, what the comments that you made earlier? Again, uh, each country has its own sort of answers to energy solutions. Clearly, Ukraine has some natural gas. I mean, I'm talking currently. They don't have a lot of oil, very little. And uh, Ukraine has nuclear capacity. They, we hear about famous Zaporozhye nuclear plants, other, as a matter of fact, Ukraine, before the war, they were producing what 60, 70% of their energy from nuclear or even greater amount they were exporting. So, so when I look fast forward for the next 10, 15 years, in my opinion, Ukraine has to become in more or less energy independent in, in sense of that word, what it, what it means that Ukraine can increase dramatically their production of renewable energy from let's say 5% current, and who knows what current is, but I'm talking pre-war, to perhaps 30%, and they have enough their production from solar, wind, you know, uh, to, to really accomplish that. Another thing, obviously, nuclear plants, you know, have to continue because I don't, I don't feel realistically Ukraine has any choice but not to continue, first of all, to rebuild or, or fix their nuclear fleet and, and continue with, uh, with, their, with their nuclear capacity. So I, I think, and again, people, some, and I'm an engineer, some people looking for some sort of a panacea, something happened and suddenly you come up with a new innovation and suddenly you can supply 
you know, huge amount of energy from small modular reactor, whatnot. But those are, we can't really rely on those as a, to make at this point to commit. But as far as between nuclear and renewables and probably some amount of gas, particularly, you know, Ukraine has sort of called district heating or district cooling systems where they supply centralized heat to the city. That's how their, their system of heating has been built. Most major cities or even minor cities have power plant and supply the, the rest of the cities. You know, it'd be very expensive to make it autonomous for each building like we have here. So I think between those, those resources, I think they could, they could supply. Obviously, it's gonna be some interchange with the rest of the Europe because they have to stay synchronized now, with, not with Russia, but with, uh, with the Western you know, electrical grids. But I, I really feel that we don't have to look at something exotic in order for Ukraine to rebuild their, their energy future. Obviously, we, we're talking about energy storage, we're talking enhancement of transmission lines, so you can have much greater you know, geographical territory to rely on, so that, that's what it is. So Ambassador Obransky, how do we, how, you, Ukraine certainly, I think everyone in Washington understands that the, the stakes are really high. How do we make that case to the American people? I mean, what, how does, about why Ukraine's reconstruction, why it matters to the U.S.? Well, first, I think it was uh, ingenious that Zelensky was invited to come and speak before the U.S. Congress. And by the way, he made that case, starting with how what's happening on the ground in Ukraine is not just confined to Ukraine. The fact that there was this unprovoked, outright, brutal invasion, when you think about it, if it happens there and under these circumstances, it can happen anywhere. So he made the case, starting with the security issue, that what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, the national security ramifications have bearing on the entire globe. And by the way, if you had asked me would I have seen in my lifetime that countries like Finland and Sweden would have come forward for NATO membership? No, doubtful. And it's very significant. It's a, it's a very clear statement. And then you look at also, and I want to connect, it's not just only about the transatlantic and you know, European and US and Western, but also the focus has been, and we're here at CSIS that spends a lot of time on Asia, is the fact of the question about Taiwan. And all eyes are on it in terms of the security issue and what does it mean. If Ukraine is not victorious and we do not do everything possible yes. to ensure that victory over the line, it has ramifications. Definitely ramifications, and certainly um, when one looks at what's happening in the South China Seas. So that's the foundation. And here, reconstruction goes to the point of, of, of preserving the guarantees for security going forward. It's not just only winning the war but also preserving and ensuring the peace here. And in this particular case, by having, getting this head start of bringing about this kind of transformation that ensures that Ukraine itself is very solid, that Ukraine has a strong security framework, a strong legal framework, um, that it also has a strong economic foundation, and that it's also not left in a gray zone a gray zone, and I don't mean here just the military term. I mean it in terms of our institutional discussion. You put forth the EU. You know that Ukraine is brought in. Yes. EU, NATO, it's been very desirous of doing that. It does have to meet the terms, <laughs> as has been laid out. But in this case, that's absolutely essential and critical. It is desirous of doing that. The Ukrainians are putting their lives on the line to achieve that. So that's the nexus of security and also why Reconstruction is important. Because with a secure, stable Ukraine, you're going to have a secure, stable transatlantic. And also, it will be a message to others around 
the globe who want to continue to wreak havoc uh, internationally. Let me add one footnote. I want to come and circle back to a point you made, Bill, because I think it's an important one. The Commission itself definitely felt very strongly and positively about this issue about reparations in this mix. I wanted to underscore that because here, when all is said and done, uh, uh, here, uh, these Moscow assets should be used towards um, a reconstruction. And I would say that there was a very strong consensus. There was a vibrant discussion about it, but also a very strong consensus on that point. Let me come back to this issue of security guarantees. Let me start, <clears throat> Ambassador Taylor and Ambassador Dobriansky. I, I would like to see Ukraine ultimately join NATO. That may take a while. <clears throat> so what are the kinds of security guarantees we can provide <clears throat> to Ukraine in the meantime. What does that look like? Because I agree, Ambassador Dobransky, that we don't want Ukraine to be betwixt and between or in a gray zone, if you will. So how do we, how do we create something that looks like, I don't know, an, an arrangement like Israel? Does it look like something like that? Let me start with you, Ambassador Taylor, and then Ambassador Dobransky. Yeah, Dan, <clears throat> it does. And the Israel model, I think, is a good one. That is, there's not there's not a treaty between the United States and Israel. There's not a defense guarantee um, that has been passed by, you know, the Senate has been ratified by the Senate. No, there's a commitment by the United States over 10 year, over a long term. The current, the current commitment is a 10 year commitment of about $38 billion for Israel, for Israel um, to give Israel top of the line weapons that are better than anything else in the region that enables them, enables the Israelis to defend themselves in a tough part of the world um, and to deter an attack. That's, that's the guarantee I think that we should give Ukraine. It ought to be modeled on this memorandum of understanding that we have with the Israelis, memorandum of understanding with the, with the Ukrainians that say, we're going, to, we commit to, to provide you $50 billion over the next 10 years to buy, you know, top is, of the is, line. Is that the number in your mind? I, I don't know what the number is. No, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's the be, number. Ambassador used to be, <laughs> 50 used to be billion the coordinator over for foreign aid, so you had the, you had the green eye shade, so you uh, kind of know these things. So. What you got to do is, you got to talk this, this way, right, for the Congress? Yeah, this way. The Congress okay. needs to be able okay, to Okay, but if you, you're in a think tank, so you can think in... in 50 billion over 10 years. Okay. There you go. I'm going uh, with that. Yeah, I got, and they have to be able to buy the top of the line equipment. Um, they got to be able to buy, you know, Abrams tanks to be able to defend. They got, they got Patriot missiles. We're starting to give them Patriot missile systems to shoot down yeah. aircraft and missiles. We need to give them that kind of capability. That's, that's top of our line. You know, are, are we Patriots. giving them the right, are we giving them the top of the line stuff now? No, uh, we're not. And we need to fix that. We need to fix that. Um, and that's, that's the immediate effort. The immediate effort is to provide the Ukrainians with the longer range weapons, the longer range rocket artillery, to be able to push the Russians out of their country. That's what, that's what they need. And for that, they need longer range artillery. They, they need armor. And we've started, Dan. You know, just last week, the Pentagon, absolutely Thumbs right, up. 50 Bradley fighting vehicles. Those are, good, those are good weapons. Those are good infantry fighting vehicles. They're not quite tanks, but they're real close. And we should give 500 of those. Um, to, to the Ukrainians for the immediate fight, but then over the longer term, to keep the Russians from even thinking about invading again, we need to give them the top of the line equipment. So Amb Ambassador Dobransky, how do we avoid, if there's gonna be a period of time between now and when they become a member of NATO, talk about how, how we protect Ukraine, how we support Ukraine. Well, I think uh, Bill, you're, you're, you're uh, well, great. I agree with that. I think Bill well described it, but I think the first goal I was even looking at, even before that, the first goal is to give them that military aid and assistance, which now the kinds that they're looking for, which will enable them to push Russian troops out of their border. That's, they have requested very clearly the desire to have Russian troops off of their territory and to have the protection of their territorial integrity and sovereignty. 
I think the arrangement that he described is, in, is a very good model. I do happen to be a proponent of NATO. I think that in this interim period, I think that this is a model that certainly works. It turns out, Dan, that once they're in NATO, it'll be a lot cheaper for us. We won't have to have this same kind of arrangement that I just described, 50 billion over 10 years, um, because their security will be guaranteed, guaranteed by NATO. It'll be a lot cheaper. And that's a reason for getting them in NATO Sooner now. rather than later. Yes. OK. Um, <clears throat> let me, Michael, let me turn to you. So there are, what would it take in your mind? You know a lot of global business leaders. <clears throat> what are the kinds of conditions that business leaders outside of Ukraine would need to see to invest in Ukraine? Yeah. <clears throat> I know, uh, Bill, you mentioned that a lot of anti-corruption laws has been approved and you know, created these commissions. And, but yet, let's not kid ourselves that Ukraine is still far away from, from where it needs to be because the court system, the legal system, but anyway, I'm just talking as a business person. What we like in the business world when we do business, key for us is a rule of law, enforcement of the contracts, legal system that not biased, you know, against you and you know supports more sort of local or players or whoever pays pays the bills sort of to to <clears throat> to judges. And uh, so the the rule of law is very important. The certainty. Because energy investment in particular, and I, or infrastructure investment in general, it's a long-term investment. It's not buy-sell. I buy grain, you get the money. I mean, we invest for decades to come. So in order for business people to do business, particularly long-term business, you need, you need certainty. You need guarantees. You need the rule of law. You, need, you have to make sure as a foreigner, you, you know, have, you, you don't have systems stacked against you and supports, for example, you know, certain local players and so on. So this is very critical and very important. Also, I would, I would say another thing is because the world is different now, every, and I speak in energy and, and infrastructure in general because we do a lot of work around the world and other companies as well. So you also have to have certain conditions where business could be done with some efficiency. If you go into something and it takes you forever to get things done because it takes too long or it's corruption or particularly just the bureaucracy or just just the, the framework of how things are gets done takes forever, people tend not to go, tend not to go there. So I think particularly for Ukraine, in the position that it is, that to attract the, the companies, the talent, the people, you know, in order to people be interested in investing there, not just for humanitarian reasons, but also for business reasons, we have to create these conditions. And I think it's very important. In, in my view, this is probably the most <clears throat> important thing that you can, Ukraine can do is to talk to the business world and make sure that they restructure their system so the foreign, not, in, not just, I'm not talking financialists, or the company who actually doing the work Call Ukraine a good place to do business. I think this is very, this is very important. And like I said, you know, I don't want people to really underemphasize. This is critical. I, if, without this, it's going to be very, very difficult. And say, you know, you don't need. You know, we're talking about government institutions. The government doesn't have money, but but it's not just government having money. It's not about money. It's just companies to look, feel that this is a good. This is a good opportunity for them. It's a good place to do business because people have choices where to do business, not just in West, but, but where to build bridges, where to build roads, where to build power plants, where to build you know, industrial facilities, manufacturing base. So I think if Ukraine does it well, people will go. May I just Please. add something on that? During our uh, commission meetings, um, by the way, we did focus on not just the EU, but also the G7. And Japan is in the chair. 
and I wanted to mention this because we had high-level Japanese participation in this, and I think it was very significant because one focus that they've had in a very practical way is not just only looking at the governmental engagement, but how to bring in the private sector in all of our respective countries and how they should be meeting and collaborating together. And I think your point is well taken, and I know that particularly in the G7 context, that was something that also really emerged. I want to talk about <clears throat> sustaining political support <clears throat> for the Ukrainian cause in Washington. We had a former Democratic senator, Senator Daschle, as one of our commissioners, and we had a former Republican congressman, Peter Roskam. Peter Roskam was great. He was, they're both wonderful to work with. But Peter Roskam said a couple of things that I <clears throat> took to heart. He said, the Americans have a sense of fairness. And what's happened to Ukraine is, in, in addition to being in a terrible tragedy and awful, this is terribly unfair. I think there's a sense that most Americans really respond to that. But also he said that, that Americans like a winner. And that Ukraine is, I think, objectively speaking, has been doing really well, and people really admire that. And I think my hope and belief is that Ukraine will get the financial and military support that it needs because it's doing so well on, on the battlefield, but also because people admire and, and it speaks to, to something about inherently about goodness and, and fairness. But there's, you know, there's some worries in Washington that perhaps maybe there won't, that, that, the, that support will, will wane over time. And there have been some, there have been some concerns both on the left and on the right. So in my time in Washington, I've never seen um, a letter proposed by members of the Congress. These were Democrats, liberal Democrats, who wrote a letter saying, why are you supporting Ukraine? And then they withdrew it. I've never seen such a thing, saying, I, I, I was just kidding. I just, I take it back. I've never seen that happen before. I've never seen a member of Congress say, I was just kidding. Now, that, that's pretty interesting. But then on the Republican side, there wasn't there wasn't a hundred percent support in the Republic in the House or in the Senate for their Ukraine supplemental back in the spring. And there have been other noises that make people nervous. And I think a lot of attention's been on the Republican side. I don't think it's totally fair given what I said about the the the, the letter from the Democrats. But I think there's been a significant attention about concerns about Republicans. So can I ask Ambassador Taylor, let me start with you about, first how about you, Ambassador Dobryansky, could you, could you talk about how we sustain political support and in particular, I think you could either talk about the Republicans or the Democrats in particular, how, how we should be thinking about this because I think there's also, there's, like I said, I think there's been particular concerns about will, will the Republican Party support uh, the Ukrainian cause going forward? Well, uh, let me make several points. Uh, first, uh, if I can, because as you were describing, you started with Americans. You know, to me, something that's really been very noteworthy, and I happen to be of Ukrainian descent, is when I travel around the United States, I find so many houses have the Ukrainian flag up. And, you know, it's, it's an indication of support for the Ukrainian fight on the ground. And I wanted to say that because no I do think that Americans just you know, across the United States, you know, not looking just here, Washington, that uh, do you know, care about that sense and issue of fairness. And I also think have been horrified at watching the kind of brutality of the kind of, in, not just infrastructure that's taken out, but my gosh, when you have a school that has, you know, uh, uh, both in Russian and Ukrainian, you know, it says, this is a, it's a, 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 a you know, exactly, a, you know, and, and it's bombed. I mean, so in that sense, I'll start with the American public. I think that the American public uh, is fair, is open, and cares about what's happening there, not just from a security standpoint, but from a fundamental human standpoint. Yeah. 
And then when you think about all the people who've been displaced, they were displaced uh, close to 2 million just starting in 2014. And I mean, that figure now uh, is well beyond, well, there was 8 million and then another 7 million. So it, it's, it's horrendous. So I, I wanted to start with that. Secondly, in terms of, you know, you ask the question, how do you sustain support? I think you have to have leadership and make the case, and at all levels. And when I say all levels, I think it's important for the president to go on TV and to update, you know, the American public and explain why we're giving this military assistance that we are, what's happening on the ground. And even if he does it with other leaders, you know, it doesn't have to be just the U.S. to show that there is a unity of purpose, certainly by a number, very strongly by a number of countries. I, I also think it's crucial in terms of Congress. Congress, it seems to me that you do have I think a number who were very affected by Zelensky coming and speaking. As I said earlier, I thought that was really an incredible move to have him come and, 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 and to speak and to make the case. Did that change minds completely, all the minds up there? I can't say that, but I do think that he made a very, very solid and strong case. And let me add, because the comment is, which was written up in the press about, well, oh, uh, I think it was a statement, oh, we won't uh, go for a, uh, blank. a blank check. Um, I think that here there's an issue of what one could consider balance. Get the assistance in a targeted way to get the job done. At the same time, look at doing things that are gonna make a difference on the ground but of course we care about us here at home. It's not the issue of you know a, 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 a blank check. It's the issue of doing the right and taking the right kinds of military steps quickly, rapidly, in sanctions, the reparations, as uh, was stated earlier, et cetera, et cetera. But finally, let me say CSIS and the private sector. Here, you focused on trying to bring together the private sector. I think it's not only about governmental institutions, nationally, internationally. I think the private sector has a real voice, and that's why I began my answer to your question with the American public, because to me, it's very striking how vested they are in this and wanting to see really fairness and a victory come out because of the kind of brutality that has been um, uh, waged here. Ambassador Taylor. I agree with Paula. <clears throat> I agree with Paula. Um, um, we need to make the case. There needs to be leadership um, at all levels, in the Congress, in the administration, private sector. Uh, we need to make the case. Uh, the case is there to make. Paula's made it. I mean, we've made the case of why we support Ukraine, why they are, how, they're fighting for us. They are dying. We're supporting them. They, we're giving them the tools. They are using the tools. And, and they're defending us. They're defending Europe. They are fighting so that our soldiers don't have to fight. We can make this case. Um, and yes, we can do both. We, we can both take care of needs here at home. At the same time, we're supporting the Ukrainians. What we're providing to the Ukrainians is less than 5% of our defense budget, our overall defense budget. Five per, less than 5% is what we're supplying to the Ukrainians. And our defense budget goes, in a large case, to defend us against the Russians, as well as the Chinese, but defend against the Russians um, in, in Europe. And 5%, and they are taking out tanks, and they are, they are degrading the Russian military. Um, so that's, that's a good investment. President Zelensky, when he was here, he said, the money that you're sending, the investment, it's an investment, it's not charity. He said very clearly, it's not charity. We're not, you're, we know, we Ukrainians, he said, no, you're not doing this just out of the goodness of your hearts. You're doing this because it's an investment in your own security. And, and that's the message we have to give. So I saw a sticker that I liked very much <clears throat> that said, Ukraine, shield of Europe and shield of freedom. So I like it. Thank you. 
Okay, we've got, I suspect we've got some thoughtful people in the audience that will have some questions, and I also think there's some uh, online as well. <clears throat> so I know that my friend, uh, Dr. Juan Jose de Boob, who online sent me, sent me a question. He's a senior advisor here at CSIS. He's the former number two of the World Bank Group, and he's the former finance minister of El Salvador. <clears throat> and he writes, I know the current focus is, to, is on peace, and the war has to stop. And I wish Ukraine the very best. But for peace to be successful and to last, you need to address what victory plus one looks like. So right now, the international community and is 100% is with Ukraine. How over time, over five or 10 years, do we ensure that the, how do we ensure that the agreements that we make with the Zelensky government aren't reversed at some point by some other government? How do we lock in some sort of a, a, poli a, a, a policy that's accepted across all of Ukrainian society so that five or 10 years from now, it doesn't change if there's a change in leadership down the road in, in peacetime? So let me start with you, Ambassador Taylor. How do, how do, you think about, how do we think about this question? <laughs> I don't know how to think about this question. So let me just say um, that President Zelensky has incredible support, has 98% has support of Ukrainians, number one. Uh, and, and the Ukrainian people support him, and he is like this with the Ukrainian people. Yeah. So he, he represents them. He, I mean, he, he is both leading them, but he also draws inspiration from them, courage from them. Um, talking about the next, you know, the next, the politics of Ukraine after that, you know, that's up to the Ukrainians. Ukrainians will decide. I mean, we know history, you know, is not always kind to, uh, to, to, to leaders. But of Winston Churchill. I was thinking of Winston I Churchill. Think, I think Dr. DeBoob is thinking about, when, I think he's thinking about Winston Churchill. So what you have to, what you have to believe in, and what I do believe in, is, is Ukrainian democracy. They will decide, they will choose their leaders and will support them. As long as they are a democracy, they're committed to the kinds of, of values that we are, um, which I believe will be the case, that has been the case, will continue to be the case, then, then we'll support them. I, I, I don't see a, a mechanism for locking in anything in for, for the next people. Okay, okay. All right, my friend here, and let's see, the gentleman, the gentleman here. Thank you, Daniel. Um, one thing I'd like to thank you very much for allowing me to participate in some of those sessions. They were very insightful. And one of the things that I found most interesting, there was a plethora of ideas. And, you know, every time we had, I was on two sessions and there were wonderful ideas in that. And what we've created and what you've created as a think tank is a wonderful path forward, a strategy, ideas and that. I just wonder if the panel could tell us how we take it from a think tank to a do tank, because there's so many ideas out there, but how do we actually get it to happen? And maybe one thing each of them could say that's an immediate priority that should be done. Thank okay, you. So let's bunch some questions together. This gentleman here, and then my friend back there. Thank you. I'm Dan Whitman, former Foreign Service, now an adjunct at George Washington. Um, we've been talking about transformation, reconstruction. To me, that means money, bricks and mortar, and the future, long and short term. Um, I know you didn't mean to exclude in the commission discussion of what do we do now, and in particular, uh, tertiary education. You know, there's a lot bubbling up. Uh, without, a lead, without leadership, but uh, Ukraine Global, uh, Global University, you may be familiar with, it's not a place, it's an idea. Um, Little Bard College is giving 40 full scholarships to Ukrainian refugees. I did a course last fall, no cost. They didn't pay, I didn't get paid. Uh, would the commission consider uh, current activities in uh, tertiary edu education as part of its agenda? Thank okay. you. We're going to bunch some questions together. My, my friend back there who's, and then, and Ramina, I'm going to have you answer this tertiary education. No, my, my, yeah, please. Yeah. 
Thanks, Dan. Congratulations to everyone on the publication of the report. Can't wait to read it. Could you say more about how you thought about the timing? So there's been a lot of discussions about when re reconstruction should begin. Should it begin in three different phases like the Ukrainian government says it should? Should we wait until there's peace and there's a real settlement? Uh, help us understand uh, what, what your, your report entails. Thank you. Okay, great. And my, my friend up here. Yeah. I'll come back to you, but I want to bunch some stuff together. Yeah. I want to go back to some of the comments made by Ambassador Taylor, but also Ambassador Dobryansky. Thank you so much for your participation. I know you had, uh, Ambassador Dobryansky, you would mentioned a, a lot of positive sentiment around the country, but I also hear the negative sentiment. Why? And this is from New York to, you know, red states. And uh, when we went to talk about Ukraine, why are we spending so much money, you know, look at the state of our economy, blah, blah, blah. And part of it is countering and this is for our appropriators, for the U.S. public, um, for, uh, and also to the appeal to the business community. Countering and changing the narrative and countering the disinformation that's currently out there in Ukraine, whether we're talking about anti-corruption. People still are thinking back to 2014. They don't know about the anti-corruption infrastructure that's been established, whether it's the NAPC, NA NABU, the anti-corruption court, uh, the special prosecutor, the asset declaration, all that. Um, the whole uh, progress that's been made on privatization and the governance of those remaining state-owned enterprises. Uh, the role of the media, uh, the vibrant media in, uh, in Ukraine, as well as uh, investigative journalists. And how do we get that information out there as well as assuring our business partners about, and in terms of the rule of law, that there is a pre predictable, enforceable business environment to encourage potential investors that it's safe to come in and invest. So how do, you know, how do we get, change the narrative? Because there is still a, a festering negative narrative about Ukraine. And I think, what can we do? Okay, so what immediate action steps when should reconstruction begin, and how do we counter a festering negative narrative? On tertiary education, I'm going to ask my friend Ramina Bandur, who's a senior fellow who's thought about things like higher education, especially in the context of Ukraine, to answer that question. But any of those questions, I'd welcome to pass. Ambassador? I'm just going to jump and work backwards, <coughs> if that's OK. Yep. So on that, I think that we touched upon it in terms of the importance of messaging. I won't dispute that I have not uh, not heard, <laughs> if not double negative there, but I have heard those that focus in on corruption in Ukraine as a criticism here. So to me, the message has to be gotten out in terms of what are the goals and objectives and what are the steps that are in fact, like in this report being proposed, being taken, and the Ukrainians that are very much solidly behind that to transform Ukraine as a country itself going forward. So to me, if I, if I may give a brief answer there, I'll let, uh, you may wanna dive in more on the, the anti-corruption you know, point act that she mentioned, but messaging matters. It's, you can't have a policy unless you have a strong, good public diplomacy strategy too, to articulate your goals and objectives. And I think that's required and necessary here. Melinda, the answer is now. The, I think the fact that this was convened was immediately, let's do it now. But by the way, we're guided by Ukraine and Ukrainians. You mentioned you know, their tier, but we felt we needed to try to get going, connect dots, look at real specific areas. Um, uh, and a number of areas are highlighted, certainly, in the, in the, in the report, but I wanted to give a, a direct answer to that. I'm going to come back to education, but it's a different thing from Romina. But on the question of uh, a do tank, um, you know, uh, Dan mentioned it at the very beginning that he got the commitment of all of us, that it's not just about the report. We're committed here going forward for implementation. And part of that implementation is actually going to a number of key uh, uh, um, sites, yeah. like I know you'll be going to Tokyo, if yeah. I may mention yeah. that. There, Japan is chairing the G7. So the question is, what are the needs? 
how can we then hook up and actually, maybe not our commission collectively, but individually, work on specific projects? You heard Michael Polsky, I mean, he's the CEO, expert on energy, so I have no doubt that he's gonna be very engaged in that piece. What one of our other co-chairs is the former CEO of Cargill. Uh, uh, Cargill, and who really spoke to the issue of agriculture. And so each of us have different expertise to bring to bear, but I'm going to say simply that we will have our tasks and assignments in an action-oriented way going forward. It's transitioning from a report effort to really an implementation effort. And I think that's going to go beyond, obviously, not just this year, but beyond. A footnote that I wanted to make on, on, excuse me, on education. I've been very struck. It doesn't go exactly to your question, but I, I felt it was important to mention the kind of goodwill that's come out. There have been so many academic institutions that I've been associated with that, by the way, have provided scholarships for Ukrainians. I'm affiliated with Harvard. Harvard's doing that. Georgetown University is doing that. I'm, I, I, I know there are countless others. But also what I think is wonderful, I know that there are a number of uh, NGOs that have been specifically formed. There's a Welcome USA uh, to actually deal not just with refugees and those coming into this country, but particularly how to get students also continued education. Like I said, it doesn't go exactly, I think your question was beyond that, but I wanted to, uh, to mention yeah. that. Thank you. Michael. I, I think Ambassador Gilmary a couple of answer, I, but I just want to mention anti-corruption. Yeah, Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Like I said, the ambassador gave a very comprehensive answer. I don't want to just go repeat myself. But as far as anti-corruption, I, I just want to tell you from a realistic standpoint, I mean, this is not a perception. This is a reality. Nobody, you know, nobody tried to make Ukraine look bad, and, and there is still a long way to go. And I talked to a lot of people in Ukraine that live there that feel that this is this is unacceptable. So it's not like somebody anti-Ukrainians just feel this this notion. So because <clears throat> I said before, this is a real issue, and you know unless we're realistic addressing an issue, we're not going to solve it if we pretend nothing happens. But it's to the benefit of Ukraine. It's not to the benefit of of United States or other countries. To the benefit of Ukraine to attract. And, and I want to repeat again, Ukraine has to be a desirable place to go. Businesses will not go because the United States said, you, you just go there. People go there because it has to make business sense for them to go. To you, Ambassador. So, Melinda, Herring asked the right question about when do you start? And I totally agree, start now. And they are starting, as we saw when we, you know, and we were there in September. Um, and first thing we did when we got to Kiev was to go out to Bucha. And what, what do you see in Bucha? People cleaning up, people reconstructing, people clean, uh, reconstructing their own homes. Um, it was amazing what, what they had already done. So that's already started. Um, and this actually gets to the question about what practically can be done. That, that is already going on, the immediate reconstruction, cleaning up the rubble. Um, it's going to take money, and, and the money again, there's $300 million of central bank reserves that can go to this kind of work, as well as the longer term reconstruction work. But the, but the roads and the bridges, again, Butcher, we saw Erpine, we were in Erpine, we saw the, that famous bridge that was, that was knocked out. Um, that needs to, you need to reconstruct that. You need to have these, these bridges and roads that are there so that the, the investment can come, so that the private sector can come. So um, yes, start right, I think start right now, as they've said, and this immediate cleanup, and they need money to do that. Okay, let me call on my friend here, and then I'm gonna give him, Romina a chance to just respond. <clears throat> Thank you, great program here. Doug Brooks, uh, International Stability Operations Association, also FGI Solutions, uh, doing some work already in Ukraine. Um, in terms of the reconstruction, I think there's two things we need to keep in mind. There's a very, I, I would say, more than even chance there may be some sort of regime change in Russia itself. Uh, and if so, and if there's any sort of fledgling democratic movement in that direction, we're going to be splitting our resources between two countries. 
uh, that will both need an awful lot of support. The other thing that we might want to keep in mind is uh, Ukraine has a very developed uh, weapons uh, program of its own uh, industry, and I think that could be quite useful to NATO uh, in, in, a, in a larger sense. Uh, and it's also been obviously taking essentially old Soviet-era totally. equipment and making it much more uh, improved, and that, that could be useful in the future. And any comments on Doug's? Just uh, thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, thumbs up. <laughs> Doug, I'm with you. I actually would like to see <clears throat> a conference, the, the, some of the things that we've been thinking about in terms of our, our, some, a conference in spring probably won't envision the military industrial base, but I think there is space for a specific conversation about Ukraine's military industrial base as a business and partnerships with American business on that. I think, I think I'd probably separate it from what, I'm, what we're imagining in Chicago or you know, down in the spring, but I think some place in, say, Texas, for example, there's a large military industrial base, something like that might be something to think about. So let's, let's talk about that. So, Ramina, I'm going to give you a chance. You've, you've done a lot of work on the future of work, <coughs> on skilling, on higher education. You recently did one of our 20 seminars was on higher education in Ukraine and what it means for the reconstruction and modernization of Ukraine. So I'd welcome any thoughts that you have. Hi. Um, yeah, we did one uh, <laughs> private roundtable. So among all these conversations that we had, some are public events like this one, but others are off the record, uh, private roundtables on higher education reform. Uh, what can Ukraine do? Uh, even before the war, there, you know, the universities there have had mushroom with, you know, with a lot of uh, career degrees that were not very valuable because of they didn't match the skills or the, um, you know, the output for the market. So um, one of the things that we could do now to support you know, uh, higher education is, like Paula said, fellowship, uh, scholarships, but also um, there's a, also um, agreements among uh, universities to pay for uh, research, um, and the, the, the professor stays in that university or the, or the student stays in the university and they pay for the services. In the long run, what we've seen is that there has to be reform, um, educational reform, uh, in the sense that uh, financial autonomy has to be uh, instructed in the um, education, uh, higher education system. So, okay. yeah, that's what I'm going to say, and then we can talk right. later. Sorry. Yeah, I, I want to thank I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the, the, all of the work of the commissioners. Uh, as I said, this is a report of the commission. We have a lot of work to do. We're going to be doing a lot of work on this here at CSIS. We appreciate this is great. This feels like BC before COVID in terms of the turnout in person. So thank you. This was great. <clears throat> so thanks, everybody. Please join me in thanking my friends and panelists.